Mr. Hartman, your witness. Thank you. Your Honor, before I start, could I ask if it's permissible to ask the back of the room if they can hear me since we've all had all these microphone issues here. I want to make sure that, that if I'm speaking to the microphone like this, can the rear of the room hear me? Can you hear, Senator? Jurors, everyone can hear. Hands up. They hear you clearly. All right. Thank you very much. State your name, please, sir. Mr. Mateer, how old a man are you? Hold on, that mic's not on. You have to hit that button right there. All right, Please. Jeff Mateer. Oh gosh, sorry. We got covered. <laughs> we heard you first and second time. Go ahead. I am 57. All right, Mr. Mateer, you're somewhat a victim of my warning you to try to speak up when we uh, were talking privately. So I think the microphones have taken care of that. Okay. Yes. And uh, where do you live now? I live in Rockwall. I'm going to ask you, in the interest of time, if you would just give us maybe a minute and a half or so, a little bit about your background, where you grew up, family, uh, professional career to where you got. Yeah, I actually grew up in central Pennsylvania, uh, and then I met a girl from Fort Worth, uh, and we were in D.C. together when I was working on the Hill. You can go down a little bit. Uh, I'll pull yeah. back a little bit about that. Right. We were work I was working on the Hill for, for first Tom DeLay and then Dick Army, met my wife. Um, she, if we, our relationship was going to continue, it made it clear that our relationship was going to continue in Texas. And so I went to SMU Law School. I graduated from SMU Law School and then after law school went to Carrington Coleman for the first part of my career. Carrington Coleman is a Dallas law firm. It's a right? large Dallas law firm, about 100 lawyers when I was there. And, and that was approximately, well, not approximately, it was 1990. Stop there and then I'll try to do a question and answer now. Uh, when you were at Carrington Coleman, uh, were you also involved in any kind of outside activities at that time? Yeah, I'd always, since college, had always been involved in Republican politics. And so I, I started, you know, did that in college. I was uh, vice president and treasurer of college Republicans. And then even though, I mean, anybody that's been associated at a law firm knows at a large law firm, you don't have a lot of time, especially if you have a family, because I had a young family, but I still stayed involved. And then I be began to volunteer on religious liberty cases. All right, now, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, we're going to try to do kind of short answers, and I'll try to jump in. You, you're aware, as every witness is, that we're working on a time clock here. Yeah, I'll do um, my best. I want to, that, that's just my fault. That's, that's my job. Don't you worry about it. Yeah. Um, so were you, any particular organizations from the time of college or law school on that you belonged to? Yeah, I, I was a member of Christian Little Society starting in, in um, uh, law school. And then in law school, also became a member of the Federalist Society. And very briefly, Federalist Society, how would you describe it and what it is? Federalist Society is, is predominantly conservative and libertarian lawyers or, in the case, or law students who care about the rule of law and conservative and libertarian policies. In addition to your political views on legal issues and others, uh, have, were you, can you, without getting into much detail about it, um, how would you describe your your life and your religion. Yeah, I mean, I, I would describe myself as an evangelical Christian. Right. And uh, at the, do you belong to a particular denomination? Uh, I'm a member of a Baptist church. Okay. Um, are you a rhino? Am I a rhino? Are you, um, are you a rhino? Do you I, know? Wait, slow down. You understand the term, do you not? Yeah, Republican in name only yes. is the term. Would you give the jury the benefit of your background and your political views? Well, I mean, I'm certainly far from right of center. Um, I was nominated by President Trump to be a federal judge. That And your nomination wasn't approved? My nomination was not successful um, after there was opposition uh, from, well, some re liberal Republicans and all Democrats. And and the relevance here I want to ask you about, have you heard the suggestion that this impeachment is really the product of rhinos, uh, liberals, uh, Democrats, uh, people that are opposed to the true conservative views? Have you heard that, have you not? I, I, yeah, I've heard that said, yes. All right, how would you apply that description to your? I mean, that doesn't describe the men and women that I worked with on the eighth floor at the Office of Attorney General. We're going to get to that in a moment. But uh, it, it, as far as you yourself were concerned, was one of the issues that defeated your nomination 
uh, comments that whether you made or didn't make that had to do with transgender policy. Yeah, and I mean, the comments involved me speaking at a Baptist assembly in which I was alleged to make comments that, that people on the left perceived to be anti-transgender. Now, at the I end should say I didn't make the comments they said that I made, but that, that was the allegation. What I'm really after, Mr. Mature, uh, uh, in your life, how would you, when you went to the Attorney General's office, how would you describe what you believed in your politics, the mission of the Attorney General's office, and the profession you had chosen? Well, look, I've always been, since law school and throughout my career, I believe wholeheartedly in the role of law. I mean, that's something that the Federalist Society, I think, instills in people who are members. But I believe in the rule of law, and I believe in cons conservative policies and conservative practice. And have you always been conservative without going into specific this issue or that issue? Have you viewed yourself very conservative on my, my, my well, you have to wait me finish. You have to let me finish. Sorry. That's okay. It's not often that people like me get a chance to. Well, I'm in a different. Wait, wait a second. You have to wait. Not often people like myself get a chance to correct people who've been a chief of staff of some organization. So I'm taking liberties with it, okay? And I'll stop you if, if you volunteer. Just try, let me finish and I'll try to let you finish. Um, I'm really, it, it, as, in terms of social issues in the political world of today, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rank yourself? 10 or 11. Okay. Now, uh, well, after you, did you go somewhere else after Carrington Coleman in Dallas? Yeah, after Carrington Coleman, a group of us who were Carrington Coleman lawyers formed our own law firm called Rosen, Rosenthal, Reynolds, Mateer, and Schaefer. Where are you practicing now? It, where am I practicing now? First Liberty Institute. And what is First Liberty Institute? It's a national religious liberty law firm. It's actually the largest uh, religious liberty law firm in, in America that's dedicated to defending religious liberty. And indeed, have y'all, since at some time recently, have you participated in several Supreme Court cases? Yeah, since I've been back, I came back in, in October of 2020, we've had four Supreme Court cases, including three very important precedent-setting cases. Well, were, all, were all of those cases oriented toward what one might say the religious right? Yeah, I mean, the, probably the most infamous or famous one is Coach Joe Kennedy, the praying football coach, um, who the school district up in Washington fired him because he was kneeling at the 50-yard line after a game. That, that case took eight, it's eight years. We just celebrated him returning to the football field this last Friday. Now, I want to ask you, why did you, and were you at First Liberty at the time you joined the uh, Attorney General? I was. I started at, at First Liberty in 2010. I started at the Office of Attorney General in March of 2016. What was your job when you started with the Attorney General's office? I was first Assistant Attorney General. Have you heard of, um, uh, when did you first meet Ken Paxton? And I was trying to, you know, I've been thinking about that. I, I would have met uh, Mr. Paxton sometime uh, prior to probably starting at First Liberty, and I would have been introduced by Kelly Shackelford. And at the time that you began with the office, what calendar year was it? What, what time of year? What year. Uh, it was March of 2016. And, and by that time, how long had you known Mr. Paxton before you began? I would guess it would have been probably almost 10 years, certainly of him. I didn't know him well, but I would have known of him those 10 years. Who hired you? Um, Mr. Paxton. In what way? Did you meet with him? Did he call you? How did it happen? Yeah, he, he actually approached me a few months before March and had asked me if I would cons consider um, coming to, to Austin. Uh, I told him I, I didn't want to come to Austin. Uh, I, quite frankly, I, I had my dream job of being general counsel at First Liberty. Today, I have my dream job. So is the answer you, he asked you to join him in Austin? He did. Okay. Well, and we, you know, I went home and, and we, I agree, he asked me to pray about it. Uh, and my wife and I did pray about it. And we felt like we were supposed to come down here. All right. And then, have you ever heard him suggest in public announcements and, and descriptions and defenses of his of his charges and so that he hardly knew you guys. That he what? That he hardly knew you. But if he, he were to say that he hardly knew you, would that be accurate? I, or I, I think- always, always, always have to let me finish. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, would that be accurate or inaccurate? It would be Statement. inaccurate. 
Uh, he knew me very well. Now, after he hired you, when you went on, uh, I'm going to be wanting to talk to you about the senior staff at the Attorney General's office. Okay? Um, and I have a diagram here I want to put up, and I want to try to do this briefly. Um, and that is a diagram of the, would you put the exhibit up for me, please? Thank you. Uh, she put the other side. I'll get the other side. Thank you. Now, I, I'm going to try to go briefly, real quickly through this. Counselor. If, uh, but what I'm after here. Counselor. Is, excuse me. Are yes, you sure. offering this as an exhibit? As to a put demonstrative. Into evidence, to as put into evidence. Excuse me, just as a demonstrative e e exhibit okay. for him to just talk about. Um, if you could, uh, would you tell the jury, uh, and I want to try to do this briefly and move pretty quickly, okay? Um, if you could tell, tell the jury how this describes what the roles of each were. And I'm going to go, for instance, your immediate below you was who? Well, b below, below me, not to the side. All right. like it, below me are the deputies. Yes. So, so the way the Office of Attorney General w was organized when I was there and when, when I came in is there were divisions. So it starts on the left with Ruth Ann Thornton, who would have been director of child support. And it goes all the way across to Darren McCarty, who, who would have been the deputy attorney general for civil litigation. And everybody in between, Lacey Mays, deputy for for. Uh, administration, Mark Penley, Deputy for Criminal Justice. I think it'll be important to understand your testimony as we go along. Do each of these divisions ha heads have particular responsibilities of their own? Th they do. I mean, they, they run a division in the Attorney General. Don't forget, the Attorney General's office is 4,200 employees, approximately 800 lawyers. And so spread out on this chart that, that's before us are the various divisions of the office. All right, thank you. So over, over to the right, or your left as we look at this chart, but to the right on the chart, uh, Mr. Bangert, what, did, what was his responsibility? So Ryan Bangert was the deputy first assistant. So if he- we, it, No, let me, let me ask you this. If one were to describe where he comes down on the political scale, liberal, moderate, conservative, obviously each of these are Republican, are they not? Um, as far as I know, each of them oh. are Republicans, yes. All right. And Mr. Bangert, how would you describe his background and his views in terms of the way he dealt with issues that affect people in this country? M Mr. Bangert has similar views to, to mine. All right. He's a person of faith who's also a very, very good lawyer. He worked for Josh Hawley uh, in Missouri. He had been a partner at Baker Botts. That very much aligns with, with, with me and, and quite frankly, all of our leadership. And then if you go to your, to the right of you on the chart, to the left of us as we look at it, who is that? Uh, that's Missy Carey, and she, she's a career OAG. Actually, her father was a deputy attorney general, uh, and as she, I mean, the joke was Missy grew up at the office of attorney general. Do you have any evidence that she's uh, a member of the deep state? Uh, she's not a member of the deep state. She cares deeply about the office of attorney general in, in the state of Texas. Now, if we look, if we look at the, the different persons here, there's been a lot of talk about the whistleblowers. Uh, obviously, you would be one, are you not? I, I'm one of the eight who signed the letter. However, when we hear about the whistleblower lawsuit, did you file a lawsuit? I did not file a lawsuit. So as you sit there now, do you have any litigation pending against the attorney general's office? I do not. Okay. Do you know whether Mr. Bangert filed a lawsuit? Uh, he did not. Are both of you among the eight that sent a letter uh, to the Attorney General uh, announcing that what you had done and after you had been to the FBI on September the 30th of, of 2020? 2020. Yes. Pardon me? Yes. Okay. Now, as we go forward real quick, uh, what's the background of Mr. Brickman? Yeah, so Mr. Brickman he served as deputy AG for policy and strategic initiatives. Uh, the attorney general and I recruited him into the office. He had been chief of staff for Governor Bevin, who was the Republican governor in Kentucky, and, and he had and, lost. And excuse me, and widely known as a very conservative governor. Uh, uh, governor Bevin was one of the most conservative governors in the country. All right, go ahead. And I had met Blake the first time at, I'd mentioned Federalist Society. One of the things that Federalist Society did is they brought together 
leadership from governor's offices and AG's offices. And, and Mr. Mateer, were each of you very active, not just in your states, but nationally in conservative Republican politics, many of which considered the evangelical movement? Yes, we were. All right. And, uh, and then who hired Mr. Brickman? Well, ultimately, the Attorney General hired Mr. Brickman, but on my recommendation. All right. And then if we go further, we have Mr. Maxwell there. Mr. Maxwell was there when you got there, correct? Yeah, Mr. Maxwell, it, it, the way deputies is on the eighth floor, there's a conference room. Mr. Maxwell would sit to my right. He was the director of law enforcement. And he, and he actually uh, had been there quite some time and had a career before you ever arrived, correct? Yeah, I think he approaches 50 years of law enforcement. He's actually in the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame. Mark Penley, who is he? So Mark Penley came in after I came in. We had an opening for Deputy Attorney General Criminal, and we, 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 we interviewed several people. Um, Mr. Penley had known Mr. Paxton for years. I think they'd been friends for over 20 years. They actually practiced together at a Dallas law firm known as Strasburger and Price. Mr. So, Pen excuse me, Mr. Penley was also a, a, a career federal prosecutor. He was after he was at, I think he was an associate at Strasburger and Price, and then he went to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Dallas. On the scale of, of uh, one to 10, where would you yourself like Mr. Pendley in terms of conservative versus moderate? I mean, again, I put him with the same as me and Bangert. I mean, he's at the end of the spectrum. Mr. Maxwell, we, we, we talked about, is one of the, the ones who filed a lawsuit, correct? Right. And then uh, Mr. Penley is one who did file a lawsuit, correct? That's my understanding, yes. So, though, so thus far, and Mr. Brickman filed a lawsuit, right? Yes. We've talked about five of the whistleblowers so far, two who have not, did not file a lawsuit and three who did. Is that correct? That's correct. And then to the right of Mr. Penley, who is that? That's uh, to my left, you're right, Ryan Vassar. All right. Uh, and, and what do you know about the background of Mr. Vassar? Ryan Vassar was a protege of Brantley Starr. Uh, now Judge Brantley Starr. Uh, Mr. Vassar had uh, clerked for Don Willett uh, and, and, and came to the, the Office of Attorney General after his clerkship. And he really, Brantley, Judge Starr, took him under his wing. And he quickly established himself as one of the smartest, go-to, hardworking young lawyers in the agency. And then Leslie Mays. Yeah, uh, Lacey is another person. She actually, I think, started as a um, elementary school teacher and then went to law school. Uh, she was identified by the former deputy for civil litigation, Jim Davis, as a rising star. And uh, she, she, she also did not join the lawsuit? She did not file a lawsuit, no. All right. She's currently deputy attorney general of Tennessee. She's the number two person in the state of Tennessee now, is she not? In, in, in the Tennessee attorney general's office? She is, sir, yes. Okay. Uh, after this all over, were you aware she could not find a, a job anywhere in government in, in Texas? I had heard that, yes. Uh, so, uh, to finish up on this particular subject, now that we've looked at, at who everyone was, to your knowledge, when each of these people joined the Attorney General's office here in the state of Texas, how did they, what would, what, how would you describe their mission in terms of their devotion to the same things the Attorney General spoke very broadly and widely about. Yeah, what all these individuals have in common, again, I told you I'm a Baptist, so I try to, th I think of three C's, okay? And, and the three C's are calling, character, and competence. And what is calling, what do you mean? Calling, by, and I know wait, that, wait, wait. sorry. I actually had just two more words if you had just waited just another few seconds, all right? But, what do you mean by calling? Okay. I know calling sounds like a spiritual term, but for me, it's really mission and it's commitment to the mission. And so it, when you're looking for people, certainly in leadership positions, whether it's at the Office of Attorney General, my current job at First Liberty, first thing I want in someone is someone committed to the, committed to the, to, to the mission. They're passionate about the mission. And what were you committed to about serve, as serving as the first assistant for Ken Paxton's Attorney General. We are, we are committed to the rule of law and to conservative governance. What's the second C? The, the, the second C is competence. So it's one thing to be passionate, like I'm passionate about baseball, but I could never have played in the major leagues. 
right? But I'm passionate about it, but I'm not confident. So in addition to having passion, you've got to have confidence. You've got to be the best. And I always felt like, you know, whether it's at First Liberty, I want the best at the Office of Attorney General. In senior leadership, you want lawyers who are skilled, people who are, are the best in their profession. So the third C is character. Because of the responsibilities, you have to have men and women who have integrity. And I actually would share this with new employees at the office, because this, this is what we wanted. You know, in someone at the Office of Attorney General, you wanted, you wanted passion, you wanted competence, excel, and, and you wanted character. Mr. Mateer, in 2015, when you joined the Texas Attorney General's Office, 2017, 2018, did you feel that office was in sync with the views you've just been expressing? I think, that, I think it was. And did really 218, 219, did you think that office was in sync with the, the values that you've been describing? I believe so, yes. Okay. At that time, did you believe in Ken Paxton and all he was saying? Absolutely, and I believe that General Paxton also possessed these characteristics. I wouldn't have come to Austin had I not believed he was a true believer. All right. Did you ultimately change your opinion? And all I want is a yes or no. I did. All right. Let's take you on that road. Um, when is the first time that you ever met? Um, you're going to find me doing that a lot. Yeah. I'm not used to it, but I'm going to do it a lot. Um, when is the first time you met Nate Paul? I've never met Nate Paul. Oh, never? Never. When's the first time you heard his name? Yeah, I'm trying to think about that. Um, it had to have been sometime in 2020. Uh, do you have any reason to believe when it was? Well, I, I, I've recently seen an email highlighting a public information request that I believe was sent at the end of 2019. Uh, it's possible that in early 2020, I heard the name the first time, but, but sitting here, my best recollection is I don't recall hearing his name until probably sometime in the spring right. of 2020. So uh, there was a, I think no one's going to quarrel with the idea that on August the 14th of 2019, this man that you still never met, Nate Paul, had a ex uh, search warrant executed on his house and business, four different, different locations, um, by a combined task force of, of uh, different agencies. Department of Public Safety, uh, Security, uh, FBI, all on his house. And I don't think the, there's going to be any question that he strongly objected and vociferously op opposed what had happened and what he contended was the way. D do you have any or did you have any memory of noticing anything about that in the year 2019? I, I do not remember noticing that, no, sir. So let's go then to the circumstance uh, in which you would have first, uh, if I could, uh, by, well, let me, uh, if, if I could, I, uh, I moved to introduce Exhibit 628. Do you have the ability to show it uh, to the president and the legal advisor? If not, you can give a hard copy. Before I move to introduce it, I'm going to ask if, uh, uh, if you would look at it and see. Um, yeah, you don't have it, so I'm going to move it to you. Yeah, may, I I, may I give him a copy of this, Your Honor? Yes, Can we look at it? Just with the hard copy. I'm trying to get this up. Any, ob any objection? Uh, have, I want to know, I want you to look at it and see, um, do you, ref you receive fundraising uh, emails from the Attorney General? You know, I actually am on, I think my personal email does get um, emails from uh, Mr. I, Paxton. I want you to look at this very quickly and see if you have received a fundraiser email like this. I believe I have, yes. All right. I move to I move to introduce six twenty eight, Your Honor.
Your Honor, this is a, uh, it appears to be an email from Ken Paxton in June of 2023, which would have no relevance to this proceeding. Well, I, I think we're now in the month of September, so it's in the past, and it's relevant as to who he says is behind uh, all of what, while we are right here, right this moment. And I just simply want to ask uh, this witness if he feels that he's, that this would accurately describe him as somebody um, that is here testifying about the Attorney General. Again, Your Honor, this man left the office in October of 2020. This is years later, has no relevance. I sustain his objection. Okay. You can put that aside. Thank you. Now, um, let me ask you this. Are you imposed of a radical transgender agenda? Your Honor, objection from reading from a document you just said was not to go into evidence. I'm just simply asking about a phrase. It is free. I got it from it, but I can, I can put this down and do it. It'd be best you put it down. Thank you very much. Right, do you find yourself an advocate, an advocate one way or the other of a radical transgender, transgender agenda? I mean, we represented people at First Liberty who've been persecuted because they had views transgender all right now at the end of that I want to go now to January of 2020 did you receive at that time I want to show uh, exhibit 559 I move to introduce Your Honor, I think this tees up the privilege issue right here. We're going to have to decide it at some point. I have no idea what that objection meant. Objection yeah. privilege. I mean, this is communications in the office between lawyers, and the privilege is held by the Attorney General. I would suggest it has nothing to do with legal advice in any way. It doesn't become magically a privilege just by the fact that two lawyers are on the email. Actually, Your Honor, if you, look, if you look carefully at the document, it's absolutely related to the legal advice, reconsideration of, an, of some sort of opinion. Your Honor, that's Honor, is that's he right in the strike zone of what legal advice is. Excuse me. Is he tendering an, an objection, I may ask, on behalf of the Attorney General's office? This was a, an exhibit submitted to us by them. Uh, objection overruled. Continue. All right, now, uh, if you would, uh, tell, tell the court real quickly what this is. It should be I, on. I'm not seeing it. Oh, now I see it. Yeah. yeah. Th this is an email that was sent from me to Ryan Bangert, unfortunately, on January 1st, 2020 at 9.01 a.m. Yeah, is that y'all's normal practice there when you were there to be working on the first day of the year at 9 in the morning? You, you know. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now, did he have a little bit more restraint and wait to respond to you the next day? Yes. Okay. Now, in this particular, in this particular email, um, did you do anything with this afterwards? Did you just simply forward to him and this, that was it? it? The issue apparently was highlighted to me as something we need to take a look at, and I would have sent it on to Mr. Bangert for him to, to deal with. No. Do you know now from looking at what the issue was? I mean, I do know the issue had to do with a public information request made by Mr. Paul and or his attorneys. All right. And so do you, but had you been involved in that at all or would Mr., hold on, would Mr. Bangert be the better person to discuss that with? Mr. Bangert would be the better person. As you sit there now, was this something at that time that you got involved in one way? No. Had the issue of the public information request having to do with law enforcement exceptions. Had that worked its way to your desk yet at that time? Not that I recall. I think this is the first time. All right. So who would be, at that time, who would have been responsible in the Attorney General's office for
for the issue of public information requests. Uh, Justin Gordon. Pardon me, Justin Gordon? Justin Gordon. And then if we went up the chain, who was above him, do you recall? Uh, uh, above him would have been, I believe it goes to, uh, memory test, I believe it goes to, all, uh, for me it would have been Ryan Bangert, ultimately, who, indeed, who was overseeing it. And indeed, so when you got that request, uh, when it says Aaron Borden, were you able to turn, determine who that was? in terms of her position or, or context of why you sent the email? Well, the, what I would have is Meadows Coyier, and, and based upon the statement that I've made, we've been asked to take a closer look at this one. That means someone asked me to take a closer look at this one. All right, and, and did you ultimately determine it had to do with a, a uh, public information request by attorneys on behalf, uh, behalf of Mr. DePaul? Nate yeah. Paul. All right, now, is all you did was just send it on to Ryan Baggert, and was that all you did with it? That's all I did. Does that help explain in your mind why you don't really remember anything about it? Until seeing this uh, and getting ready for today, I don't recall. Okay, all right. Now, um, when is the next time that you remember ever hearing the name Nate Paul? I really think it was June of 2020. All right. So we're in June of 2020, are we? And what was the circumstance in which you did that? I think that's when is, is, is the first time I was introduced to an entity called the Minty Foundation. I think, it, I think that's the name, Minty Foundation. All right. Now, I'm going to uh, move to introduce at this time, Your Honor, Exhibit 62. Before you do that, I want to uh, uh, admit uh, Exhibit 559 that I rolled on into. Thank you very the much. Evidence. No objection to this document. Now, uh, it will be admitted into evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. What would you, what, what do you, uh, could you tell the jury very briefly what this document is? Okay, this is an executive approval memo regarding, um, and I think, I can't move it, but um, I think it's, it's regarding a, there, there we go. It, it's regarding a request to intervene into a legal matter. All right, now let, let's uh, we'll try to move this through this quickly. If we, can you very briefly describe the process for a particular, that would call for a, a litigation memorandum like this? Yeah, so anytime we're gonna approve some sort of action, if it's filing a lawsuit or it's intervening into a lawsuit, we had in place a process in which the, a lawyer in a division, so in this case, uh, it looks like Mary Henderson, who it's from, would request an action. And in this action, we want to intervene into this lawsuit. So this memo sets forth the reasons why the Office of Attorney General should intervene into a matter. It then goes up the chain of command. So it goes up to her division chief, which in this case w would have been uh, Josh Godby, who was chief of, I think it was uh, financial trust and, or financial transactions and charitable trusts. And then it goes up to who? And then it goes up to the deputy over civil litigation, who's over all the, the divisions of litigation, and then ultimately it would go up to me. And the way the DocuSign system works is, it, Mary signs it, then it goes to Mr. Godby. If Mr. Godby doesn't sign it, Mr. McCarty doesn't see it. Once Mr. Godby signs, it goes to McCarty. Once McCarty signs, it, it would come uh, to me. All right, so this is important, Mr. Materi, and I want to, because there'll be another occasion for this same process. How is the decision made as to who all is on this executive, uh, this executive memorandum? Yeah, we, we had to actually have a signature matrix and, de and depending on what the issue was, okay. we, 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 we had, a, and these were in place when I came in, and, I, and my understanding is they date back to at least when Governor Abbott was, was Attorney General, maybe even further back. All right, so this, this process that requires everybody in the division and then up to you to pass off on it is designed to do what? Well, I mean, the policies and procedures are there to actually protect us all and ultimately protect the agency and also protect the Attorney General. All right, so in this particular case, if Ms. Henderson is recommending the intervention in a lawsuit, 
Is that right? That's correct. And what, and, and lawsuit says the public interest in a charity, correct? That's right. In that recommendation, what would have happened if Joshua Godfrey, the person right above her in the DocuSign matrix, if he said no, does that kill it? If he says no, it kills it, and I would only hear about it if someone brought it to me. So are we to understand that if Mary Henderson sent this recommendation above and it got to Joshua Godby, and he, if he said yes, then it would go to Mr. McCarty, but if he said no, that's it? That's correct. Okay. So in some actions that are being recommended, how many people is your, was your system designed to work through before it got to you for approval? Well, in this case, three. In some other situations, it's even more people. Okay. We're going to get to one that has to do with out hiring outside counsel in a while. That had a lot more people that had to go through there, correct? That's correct, because we were spending money. All right. And that's what added people? Yes. I mean, right. one of the reasons, yes. And would it also be add people if it crossed two different divisions jurisdiction? Correct. All right. So here on this one, at the time of this one, you signed off and approved it, did you not? I did. So you approved, but your approval on here meant they were, your people were given permission to do what? In a lawsuit involving this charity. It, it gave permission for them to intervene into that lawsuit on behalf of, 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 of the charity. At this moment on June 6th, or is that eight? I didn't put my glasses on. Um, is that six, eight? I think it's, it yeah. looks like the eighth. All right. At that time on June 8th of 2020, what was the extent of your knowledge about the particular issue of lawsuit that you were approving an intervention on? It is possible that Mr. McCarty had told me about it, that, and sometimes deputies would give me heads up that something was coming. Uh, and so I, what I, what best recollection is I probably have gotten that heads up. Be, yeah, I would have gotten a heads up. Would you be aware that the line people in the past had waived intervention and made an affirmative decision not to intervene in that lawsuit. I don't think I was aware of that at this time. All right. Were you aware that the lawsuit was a lawsuit between the charity and an entity controlled by Nate Paul? You know, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't remember. I at don't this time, in June of 2020, had you become aware at any level of consciousness in your mind of Nate Paul? Not in early June, I don't think right. so. So we're, we can safely rest assured that whatever you're going to tell this jury today is based on information that you got after June 8th of 2020. I th that's correct. Sir. All right. So were you aware of any issue at the time you proved the intervention yourself at this time um, that would have includes you to how strongly opposed to this intervention the people who represented the charity were. I, I, I don't recall any of that, no. All right. Now, you see that this, I don't want to go into it, but you see there are multi-pages here. Do you recall you would have, whether or not you would have read through these, or would you since you relied on the line worker that recommended it? Well, actually, it, it, two answers. I, I would have relied on the people, but I also did read it. Okay. Now, what did you think that y'all were doing in this and why you were intervening in this lawsuit? I, I thought based upon uh, Ms. Henderson, Ms., Mr. Godby, and Mr. McCarty's recommendation, this was in the interest of, of the state of Texas to intervene into this lawsuit. Did you have any idea at that time whether Mr. McCarty thought it was a good idea? Um, I assume since he sent this memo, he did. Were you aware of one way or the other as to whether Mr. Paxton had any input in this decision? I, I was not aware, no. It, that wouldn't be uncommon. Do that, you, wouldn't be. that would what? It, it would not, I mean, because the, the Office of Attorney General, at, when I was there, it was over 30,000 litigation matters, cases, civil matters. So but, Mr. I didn't know about everyone, and there's no way the Attorney General could. So let me ask you, at this time, were you aware one way or the other whether Mr. Paxton was in contact with both Mr. Godby and Mr. McCarty urging this intervention? In June, I don't think I was aware of that. Okay. Did you later become aware of that? In July, I became aware of that. All right. But at this time, not. Correct? Not in not in early June. No, I don't believe All so. Right. Now. Were you aware? Had you ever dealt with the charitable trust 
to understand uh, what the obligation of the Attorney General's office was as, toward charitable trust? I mean, I came to learn of it, yes. But you have That's, not. I'm not a charitable trust lawyer. Okay. And at June 6th or June 8th of 2020, were you familiar with the Mitty Foundation one way or the other? I don't think so. Okay. Now let's go, if we can, uh, to uh, Exhibit 67. I move to introduce uh, Exhibit 67, Your Honor. No objection. Can you tell us what this is, please? Admitted into evidence. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I apologize, I jumped the gun no on No problem. Uh, can you tell us what this exhibit is, please? It is another executive approval memorandum for civil litigation, and this one is a request to investigate, not so contrary, not the same as, as intervening, but to investigate a, a charitable trust, the Mitty Foundation. Do you have any personal memory or, or anything about this event or why this one was done? Other than it has my initials on it, I do not. And it's a little later, is it not? That's correct. It's, I think, the next day, June 9th. Looks like and I sign it on June 11th. Okay. Now, uh, did you ultimately, I want to go if I can, uh, were you having contact? You've, had to, but you've talked about Darren McCarty. Or we have. Joshua McGodley. Were you at this time have any contacts with the line lawyers on this case? Not with the line lawyers. My contacts would have been with Mr. McCarty. He had a one-on-one -on -one every week with me. All right. Now, what was Mr. McCarty's primary duties at this time in the overall scheme of the office? I mean, he was in charge of all the civil litigation. So all those 30,000 cases, they, they would be at Darren. However, his, pro his number one job in addition to leading that was we, we had two major pieces of litigation. One against Google and, and one, well, one that was a big litigation against the opioid manufacturers and distributors. All right. And, and how, many, how much money potentially was involved in that? Oh, billions of dollars. All right. So let me ask you this. Uh, Mr. McCarty, uh, how much of his time would you estimate he was spending on the Google case? I mean, a fair amount of his time. I would say over 50 percent because that was a major piece of litigation for the office. Ordinarily, would he be pulled in to, to managing or doing anything of a, a lawsuit this I mean, size? You, you can't, we have 30,000 cases. I can't be involved in every case. The deputy for civil litigation, one that is not, I mean, obviously significant to the parties, but in the scheme of things for the state of Texas, that's very unusual. Did you have any idea at that time why Mr. McCarty kept getting, in, getting involved in this case? I mean, in June, no. All right. When did you become aware? I, I, Mid-July. All right. Uh, at this time, we forgot, we haven't really mentioned the fact that we're talking about the era of COVID, are we not? We are. And, we're, and, in the, yes. we're in the month of June. COVID was roughly, as far as the, the, the governor's proclamation and everybody running around on it, trying to figure out policy, that was the middle of March, right? Yeah, I mean, COVID took a, I mean, the whole COVID effort took a lot of my time and Mr. Bangert's time and Mr. Vassar's time, quite frankly. Right. Do you have any explanation as to why people such as, as he and y'all were being involved in this kind of case? I mean, we, we just normally wouldn't have been involved in this time of case. All right. Uh, now, um, I want, if I can, to go to Exhibit 147. Any objection? I moved to introduce you. I'm sorry, Your Honor. No objection. All right. Admit Exhibit 147 to evidence. It's up on your screen now. What is this? Yeah, this is an email exchange be between me and Mr. Nate Paul. Well, how did it come about that you and Mr. Nate Paul were having email exchanges I, about? I, I, I don't know because it came, for me, came out of the blue. Um, He's in this email, he's asking to meet with me in person. As I testified to earlier, I had never met Mr. Paul. I've never talked to him on the phone. Um, at some point in July, I became aware of him. That must have been through the attorney general uh, who would have alerted to me about, about him. All right. 
So now, this is dated on July the 17th, is it not? It is. Do you have any idea why uh, Mr. Paul would feel so, so comfy asking you for an appointment that he's calling you Jeff if neither one of you have ever met each other? I, I can only speculate. Were you aware by that time he was friends with the Attorney General? I, I don't know if I knew what the extent of the relationship was. I knew they had a relationship by then, I think. And so this, uh, this idea that he would, you would talk to him on the 17th, uh, what was your three or four word, three word answer? Um, remember I'm Baptist, so it was I'm not available. All right, and why did you say you were not available? Well, I knew at this time that there was litigation involving Mr. Paul. I mean, I, I, I would have known that, and it would not be my practice to meet with someone who's represented by counsel, who is, I mean, they're not, it, it's an, it, an right. opposing party, it's just, they're involved in litigation that the state is involved in. That, that would just, I mean, it, beyond that, as a lawyer, that's, I mean, you just don't do things like that. Well, to put it another way, you guys were in litigation with Mr. Paul as one of the parties. Would you ever meet with him without his lawyer? Well, we had intervened into a lawsuit. Right. And so we were, I mean, we were in the middle of the V, so to speak. All right. So is that why you showed, told him you would not talk to him? That is right. All right. Now, um, I want, if I can, I'm going to, well, let's, uh, let's go now, if we can, to Exhibit 87. This last one we just looked at was July uh, the 18th, right? You remember that? July 17th and 18th, Any correct. Objection? Hearsay, Your Honor. This document is hearsay. Well, I, I wasn't filled with the question. Let's just, the doc, the, I haven't asked him, I haven't asked to admit it yet. Uh, I will. Well, I just thought he had forgotten, but. So the, docu the two documents are, one is July 18th and the one you're being shown now is July 22nd, is that correct? I'm, I'm not seeing it yet, but I do know I did That's a memo a to the point. file on July All 22nd. Right. Let me just walk up with you, show you the hard copy to identify it. It's not in evidence yet, so don't testify from it. Okay. Tell me whether you recognize that as a memo of yours. Mr. Harden, give me a moment. I want to work through this. Sir. Give me a moment. I want to read through this on his sure. objection. Are you submitting it? Not yet. Okay. I will, I, but not yet, if that's okay. Did, did, did the court have something on your mind you wanted to? Move on. Thank you. Um, that uh, I want to ask you now, back on that earlier email, Mr. Uh, Mr. Paul asked you for a meeting on a particular date, did he not? Right, I think he wanted to meet the the following week, that, that, that Monday. Well, let's do, let's do for the record and, and the court real quickly. July 17th, let's go back if we could to 147, Stacy. Yeah, I'm seeing it. That memo says, does it not? Or go ahead and read it out loud for the jury. Yeah, it says, I hope all is well. Are you available for an in-person meeting on Monday? Which right. would have been the 20th, I believe. Well, that's, Let's, yeah, that, that's what I want to do. Let's figure out the dates for the jury. Up above, we know when you said I'm not available, it was July 18th on Saturday, correct? So Monday would have been the 20th of July, is that correct? That is correct. Did you later discover there was any significance uh, to meeting on Monday in terms of anything else that was supposed to happen that week? 
well, I, I found out on the morning of July 22nd that there was a hearing I involving the Mitty Foundation case. And on, on July the 22nd, that would have been a Wednesday, would it not? That would have been Wednesday, yes, sir. What time that day did you find out that there was a hearing uh, scheduled for that it, day? It must have been pretty early, because I normally arrived at the office 7, 7.15. And I got a call that morning before I left for the office from Darren McCarty. Did, did you later go back, Mr. Mateer, and figure out that the meeting Mr. Paul wanted on Monday the 20th concerned this hearing on the, on the 22nd? I, I believe that was the case. All right. But not having met with him on the 20th, until you got to the office that morning or whenever you were contacted, were you aware before the morning of the 22nd that there was a hearing scheduled for that day? I was not aware. How did you become aware of that hearing? Yeah, Mr. McCarty, the deputy for civil litigation, called me, and I remember being at my condo um, in downtown Austin. Again, had to have been sometime in the six o'clock hour, uh, and he had advised me. Objection, hearsay. Yeah, he, he's okay. certainly right, it is. So after, what did you and, and and the others become concerned about what was about to happen, what was about to be proposed that morning? I was concerned that the attorney general was going to appear in Travis County District Court and argue a motion on behalf of the Office of Attorney General. Well, why would that concern you? Well, I mean, at the time, I couldn't remember a, a, a sitting attorney general actually going into a district court to argue anything. I mean, the last one was probably Dan Morales. Uh, what was your fear? Uh, my, my, I mean, General Paxton has wa some wonderful qualities, but he is not a litigator. And, and to think that, that he would go into court arguing a motion just, just made absolutely n no sense, and especially on a matter, I mean, this isn't the Google case. This wasn't a Supreme Court argument. This was, with all respect to those who practice in Travis County District Court, it was Travis County District Court. All right. Mr. Mateer, as a result of your concern, did you organize a meeting? I, I did organize a meeting that morning. That's all I'm asking right now. All right. And, and who all did you have at that meeting? Well, I, I had Mr. Paxton, uh, and I had Blake Brickman, and I had Mark Rylander, who was the Deputy of Communications. Okay. And uh, at that meeting, what was your intent for that meeting initially? I mean, I wanted to find out what Mr. Paxton was thinking. Because, I mean, just it was inconceivable to me that he would want to go to district court to argue something. Did you know at that time on whose behalf the argument would have in effect been? I think, Mr. McCarty, I would have, yes, I would have known. And who was that? Well, it would have been, it would have been in the Mitty Foundation at the urging of Mr. Paul. All right. And when you, when you had the meeting, before you started talking about other things with the Attorney General, what did you discover in terms of whether somebody had changed his mind? Well, I, I did learn that actually Mr. Paxton, that Mr. McCarty was successful in, in having the Attorney General not go to that hearing. He, he was persuaded not to go. So then what did, you move, what did you move that meeting of July the 22nd? What subject did you move it to? What's, well, it had to involve Nate Paul. I mean, just that the Attorney General being involved in matters like the Mitty Foundation, things, again, that were not significant litigation matters at the Office of Attorney General. By that time, and by talking to other deputies and information, had you cons become concerned about the Attorney General's relationship with Nate Paul? I was starting to become concerned. So during that meeting, did you take any position and urge him in any way concerning Nate Paul? Objection, hearsay. And also it's privileged, Your Honor. I, I, think, I think what we're Sustained. about to have, uh, yes, what I'm about to offer, Your Honor, uh, is, uh, party admissions by a party opponent, comments that Mr. Paxton made in that meeting is the reason for it. And I think that comes in under admission by the party opponent. Move on. Sure. You say move on? Move on. Okay. Now, in that meeting, did you yourself make any particular urging of the Attorney General? Objection, hearsay, and also privilege. Object on both grounds. 
I haven't asked him for the statement. Overruled. Thank you. Did you? I did. And what did you urge him as it regarding Nate Paul? Again, Your Honor, this is hearsay, and also it's him advising the Attorney General, which is privileged communication. First of all, the Attorney General is not here, and he doesn't have the right to claim an attorney-client privilege. There is no personal attorney-client privilege for him this. The only question would be as to whether the Attorney General's office had the right to invoke it. And I respectfully suggest they did not. Overruled, move along. Thank you. So, what did you urge him? I urged him not to have any further dealings with Nate Paul, to let the lawyers, the professionals in the Office of Attorney General, handle these matters as they saw fit. What was the Attorney General's response? He committed to that. Objection, hearsay. Also, it's a communication, Your Honor. I think this comes under the party admission, Your Honor. This is, uh, I think, clearly admissible. In, in terms of uh, the Attorney General, uh, these are, he's the party, and, and this is an admission being offered as admission by him. Overall. Go ahead. The, the, the Attorney General committed to me with Mr. Rylander and Mr. Brickman in the room that he would have no further dealings, that he would allow the office, the professionals in the office, to handle the matter. How long was this meeting that y'all were in? I, I guess a 30 minutes or so, maybe 45 minutes. Now I'm asking you demeanor and manner as opposed to actual words. How would you describe how insistent you were in your urging of him to have no more contact with Mr. Paul? It was very troubling to me that the Attorney General would be willing to appear in Travis County District Court. So I, I was very concerned that why he would want to do that when we have, again, 800 attorneys at the Office of Attorney General who are very capable. My question is, how insistent were you? I was pretty insistent. Obviously, you recognized he had the right to talk to anybody or help anybody, you thought, right? Well, and I wanted in this meeting, that's why I, I had Mark Rylander there. Because Mark Rylander, his title was deck, Director of Communications, but the, the joke in the office was I was first assistant and he was first friend. All right. So in this meeting, how would you describe the demeanor or earnestness or lack of or whatever the Attorney General's outward response when he told you he would not do it anymore? He seemed sincere to me. When you left that meeting, what did you believe in terms of the Attorney General's conduct in the future or contact or attempts to help Mr. Paul? I was hopeful that he would allow the professionals in the Office of Attorney General to do their jobs and he wouldn't be involved anymore. All right. Were you surprised to discover later that the very next day he's contacting other assistants on other matters to help Mr. Paul? Surprised and disappointed, yes. All right. During the time from July the 22nd, from then on, after his assurance that he would not have nothing more to do with Mr. Paul, did you become aware that his contacts with Mr. Paul had become even more frequent? I did. Did you become aware that those contacts that were more, much more frequent also touched a broader variety of activities? I did, than yes. just charity? Yes. Okay. At this time, uh, Your Honor, I will move to introduce uh, what my number was. I don't have it here. The number of the last exhibit. Can Is I that number 87? Uh, exhibit 87. Thank you. Admit it. We, we object. First off, hearsay, Your Honor. Second off, it's clearly he's, he even expressed concern for the Attorney General. That was his client. This talks about communications between client and lawyer. This is a privilege issue, square and away. I'd already admit it. I already admit it, 87. Overruled. Now, I want to, if I could, um, I want to ask you to move on to another exhibit. But let me ask you something before I go there. 
Um, that meeting was on the 22nd, and I apologize. I think when you're uh, talking, I may be dropping my voice some here. I'm hoping people in the back can still hear, but let me, let me make sure they can at this tone of voice. And I, um, did you ultimately respond to back where you and I were before uh, to anyone about the particular request that had been made of you by Mr. Paul to meet back on that Monday. Remember, on the, on the 17th, he asked to meet you on a, the 20th, correct? I, th I think at some point, Mr. Paul's lawyer sent me either a letter or an email, um, which I respond to, again, I think by email. All right. What I want to do is, let me, if I may step over briefly, if I may have your permission to get the number. I'm going to come up and give you a copy of it so that you can look at it. Thank you. Uh, I've been corrected by somebody who knows much more than I. I really should be talking about 161. It's the same document, but I gave it the wrong number. In my, in my questions. Now. Do you have it? Stella. Stella, did we, Stella, excuse me, did we give him one? Army, if we can just find one in another book. I'll give him mine until we get it. But, uh, Mr. Hardy, you want, I'd look at it if you need it. I think I remember it. Here's what I'm asking. Now that you've had a chance to look at 161, does that refresh your memory as to when you then responded to his request to have met back on the 20th? It, yes, it does. All right. And when did you, we've gone through the meeting on July 22nd. You've had the conversation we heard about with the Attorney General. And then now you've moved back uh, to July 24th, two days after the meeting with the Attorney General, correct? Correct. And so then did you sit down and draft a memo uh, and respond, rather, uh, to uh, whom? Well, to Mr. Paul's lawyers. And actually, I didn't really know who they were at this time. And so I was asking for information so I could adequately respond. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah. All right. So here's what I wanted to do. The reason I stopped about giving the name, I wanted you to give it. At the time you received a letter from Mr. Paul, did you even know who his lawyer was? I, I did not or didn't remember. All right. So then when you checked around, did you become familiar with whom you were going to be talking to? I, I did. And who was that? Well, I, I probably, I, sitting here, I don't remember. I know Mr. Wynn was one of his lawyers. All right. Well, that, actually, let me just ask you and focus on that. Did you become aware that a Mr. Michael Wynn was representing him in some matters? I did in, in, during that time period. And, yes. re and regardless of who he was, had you, by the time of the 24th, looked at the history of correspondence with Mr. Paul in terms of the way he talked to your people? I mean, he attached in, 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 in his email to me, he attached. Is this the email? Excuse me. Is this the email back on the 17th? Um, I think it's an e a later email. All right. And what did he attach for you? 
he attached correspondence that he had with primarily Mr. Godby, and com and in which he's complaining to Mr. Godby. What, exactly. Was he complaining about the treatment he was getting in the Mitty Foundation lawsuit from Mr. Godby? Yes. Was he complaining that he kept writing Mr. Godby, he the party, writing the lawyer for the other side? Was he complaining in constant emails about Mr. Godby? That's exactly what he was doing, yes, sir. And Mr. Godby, because he's not supposed to talk to a represented person, had done what? He, he had not responded, which would be what any lawyer would do. You don't respond to the client or the, of the potential opposing party, you respond to their lawyers. When you looked at the letter, uh, or the, actually when you were getting ready to write him on the 24th, did you have occasion to review that, that correspondence? I did, yes. And uh, that's why I move, if I could, Your Honor, to 161. I move to introduce 161. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. This privilege issue keeps coming up. As you can see on the document itself, it says, this is attorney work product communication regarding a pending litigation matter. I mean, it's labeled as such. And, and I would suggest to the court that all of these types of emails are, in fact, work product or attorney-client privilege communications, and the only individual in that office who holds that privilege and who can waive that privilege is the elected attorney general. <laughs> I, I have to, I'm sorry for laughing. I have to, yeah. So this is when sometimes we might take positions that come back to bite us. This is actually his exhibit that we agreed to pre-admit. And so I am offering an exhibit that it was pre-admitted by us to him because it was one of his exhibits. Well, I, well hold on. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how he can now turn around and make a bunch of objections to an exhibit that he agreed to pre-admit. That we agreed to pre-admit and he accepted. It's his pre-admitted exhibit. It's in evidence is my point. I, I'm very confused because um, that was very confusing, but I would suggest this to the court. They marked, they put 161 on this as if it was their exhibit and moved it into evidence, and you asked for my objection. Yeah. 161 on their exhibit list is not this. Uh, so, I mean, I'm trying to, first I guess we need to figure out what exhibit he's actually trying to offer, and if he's really trying to offer this, it ain't the right number, and if it's, he's offering something that's already in evidence, then obviously I wouldn't object to it. But I'm very confused about what he's trying to do. The court is very confused too. Uh, I, I wish, I wish, I, I'm still, I, I suggest he talk to, like I did, talk to someone on his side that knows more than he does about this. If he notices that exhibit that we introduced is AG 161. That's the Attorney General 161. I think if he checks with his people, he's going to find that's their exhibit that we agreed to pre-admit. I didn't have any discussions with Mr. Harden. I mean, I know he's accused me of being uh, recalcitrant. I haven't had any discussions about the exhibits, but my colleague, uh, Dan Cogdale has, as I understood it, they weren't going to object to any exhibits that we offered. They have no objections, but we certainly, we had exhibits on our list that we may not offer. So I think that's probably what the dilemma we have, but I'm going to turn it, if you don't mind, since, since I didn't talk to Mr. Harden personally, maybe Mr. Cogdell can, can I, enlighten I, me. I again suggest he talks to someone who knows something about the subject. I, I've just been handing my Ms. Jarris, and I'll be glad to tender to the court, where they have That, that might be true, but you need to let us know you're offering our exhibit. I mean, that, when you say 161, that presupposes you're offering your exhibit 161. That's why we looked on your list, and this ain't your exhibit 161. Now, with regard to whether these were pre-admitted or not, I would turn it on to uh, Mr. Cogdale. In, in light of him objecting to us at this extended time, this may be the first time I'm asking the court to take that in consideration. They've been objecting to their own exhibit. Mr. Cogdale. Judge, in my conversations with Ms. Revorka, both... Speak into the microphone, please. Yes, in my conversations, and I understand Mr. Harden's heartburn that he didn't object to ours and we're objecting to his, I get that. That notwithstanding, in my conversations, both orally and in email exchanges with Ms. Revorka, I very clearly stated that while I appreciate they're not objecting, all we did not intend to offer all of our exhibits. Many of our exhibits were marked for identification purposes only. 
for impeachment, for whatever. So I never said, just because you didn't object to them, we, we, we want to offer them all. That never happened. I, I think we may be raising game and chip to a new level. The fact is, it is their exhibit. They asked if we would agree to pre-admit. We agreed to pre-admit. That put it in evidence. It's, it's as simple as that. No, it doesn't. Just because they didn't object to it, that somebody has to offer it. We never said all our exhibits that we marked are coming in. We never said that. I never said that. I get his heartburn, but I ne I'm happy to pull the email up in my, my exchange with Ms. Braborka, but I clearly said in there, we do not intend to offer all of our exhibits that have been marked. I'm glad we don't have to poll the kids in the, in the um, upstairs as to what they think about this exchange. We've now used about eight or nine minutes, I think, on a, them objecting to their own exhibit. I, I tender 161. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear Mr. Hart. I couldn't hear the last part. Right. I'm sorry. I said, I'm glad that we do not have to poll the kids in the balcony as to whether this exchange makes any sense. I think we've taken about eight or nine minutes now on something that where y'all are objecting to your own pre-admitted exhibit. Again, they're not pre-admitted. They haven't been offered. We never said, if y'all don't object to them, we're offering all of them. To the contrary. I'm gonna take a five minute break. <laughs> 